Welcome. Thank you so much for coming to day two of the first annual Speak Symposium. I'm Dr. Rick Hofer, Director of Speak Project at the University of Texas at Arlington. We're really looking forward to some great dialogue and education around the important topic of amplifying the voice of social work in policy. We had a great day yesterday and uh, we had a great first session earlier today and now we're moving on to this session. We gratefully acknowledge the support of Simmons Sisters Fund at Texas Women's Foundation. Please note that every session is being recorded and will be available in the coming weeks. Each speaker will present for a few minutes, followed by discussion and Q&A. Should you have any questions during the presentations, please feel free to put them into the chat. We will address them with all the other questions at the end. You will also receive a survey later on today. We would love to get any feedback you might have on this event. Further, we want to acknowledge the land on which our buildings stand is unceded and stolen territory from the native peoples in this area. We also acknowledge the grave harm brought by colonialism to this land, especially the systematic attempts to erase indigenous and African identities through slavery and racist segregation laws. This upcoming session is how to use social work textbooks to amplify the voice of social work, a topic I don't think has been explored as much as, as it should be. It's, a, it's one of those hidden topics, hidden things that we don't really acknowledge. So we're going to bring it to the light today. To help us understand this topic, we have several top-notch textbook authors who will discuss their books, why they wrote them, and how they see the books contributing to the field of social work advocacy. First though, we will have one of the unsung players in social work publishing, Cassie Graves. Cassie Graves is the senior vice president at Cognella Incorporated. For over 25 years, she has been developing textbooks in the disciplines of counseling, social work, human services, and family studies. Since joining Cognella in 2015, she has continued to build and grow their offerings in these key areas by valuing authors' unique perspectives, providing a platform for introducing their work to thousands of students nationwide, and investing in helping these critical disciplines move forward in interesting and innovative ways. I'm gonna ask Cassie to address a few questions such as, how did she get interested in social work publishing um, and what drives her in her quest for new books? How does she approach the book proposals that she's given? Of course, I'll leave it up to her to talk about anything that uh, she thinks is important along these lines. But anyway, Cassie, I'll turn it over to you. Uh, so for the 15 years that I worked at SAGE, probably more than that. Um, the focus really was, um, so on the one hand, there's a business aspect of having to publish books that are successful for key courses in the curriculum. Um, but on the personal aspect, it was how can we bring some of these really timely, critical, important issues into the curriculum? Um, so my approach with authors has always been um, we want to be evolutionary, not revolutionary. Um, I've been approached by a lot of people who have these wonderful ideas how they just kind of want to blow up the current curriculum and come up with, you know, different ways of teaching. It's not working. And um, the problem with that is that there is a wave or a momentum and a current curriculum that has to be addressed. There are certain topics that have to be addressed. So the best way to achieve change is through incrementally adding areas or topics that are um, emerging or that are um, innovative into sort of the current um, framework of teaching. Uh, so that's that's always been my approach. Um, at Sage, 
we had a very strong emphasis on issues of race and culture and social justice. Um, and when I left SAGE and joined Cognella, uh, I, I brought that approach with me. Um, so much of the, the books that you will see on our list, uh, many, many of them in counseling and psychotherapy, I would say, in social work, uh, probably 80% of them have a focus either on advocacy, on social justice, on um, issues of race and culture. Um, and it's just been something that's been ingrained in me from my early years in publishing. Um, so I think it's really being a publisher, I carry that with a lot of um, importance. Um, I know the disciplines I work in very well. I work with a lot of people who are very passionate. Um, and I think it gives us the opportunity through just through the dissemination of knowledge and through the development of textbooks to really make an impact on a field and on a discipline. And so I've carried that with me through the years and through the disciplines that I publish in. Um, and I've been doing this for many, many years and we've published books that have a focus on advocacy, that have a focus on anti-oppressive practice, that have a focus on social justice for you know 20 plus years. And now we're really starting to see that our society is a, has been a little bit behind. Um, now we're kind of catching up and there's a lot of interest and in these issues from recent events over the past years. Um, so it just really kind of speaks to doing, you know, what you're passionate about. And I think that's always been my focus. Of course, we have to make money as a commercial publisher, but um, it's really, I think that where the books that we're publishing are really, really getting noticed because of that focus on advocacy, on social justice, on, um, you know, some of the issues I talked about. So, so I don't know if I've answered the questions properly, but um, that's kind of been my approach to creating a list and a program. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Um, you and I have talked about how sometimes a book is just, uh, you will accept a book knowing that maybe it's, it's time is not now. And uh, it turns out in two or three or five years, you have picked the book that is needed at that moment. Can you give us an example of that and kind of how you spot those, those sleepers that need to be published, but, but no one else understands that? Yeah, def though, there's so many examples of this. Um, and this is where working at Cognola has really been um, really a great um, privilege and honor for me because I'm in an environment where new ideas are very welcome and um, encouraged. Um, so my approach has been so not only publishing books for key courses, but also keeping an eye on emerging trends. Um, and those books, I, I know that they're often, I, I know the discipline well, I go to the conferences, I read the journals. Um, so when I hear of a book that is being proposed in you know, certain topical areas that may not even be a course in the curriculum quite yet, I, I feel like I have a good gut and I have a good, uh, sorry for the dogs, <laughs> um, a good um, instinct about emerging areas. Um, so some of them are areas Back in 2010, I published a book on anti-oppressive practice um, in social work. And I remember presenting the book to our publications committee, and there was a lot of skepticism about it because they couldn't quite see where that book fit into the curriculum. And I felt like it was a very important area, an important topic. The authors were very passionate. And what the authors I worked with were trying to do in their school, I thought would be a great model for other programs. Sometimes offering a publication or a book becomes the, um, the, uh, the way that other programs can, can offer a course because if materials aren't available, it's sometimes difficult to, to add a new course. So 
we signed that book in 2010, I believe, at Sage. And we have the new edition that's just published now. And CSWE is giving greater focus on anti-oppressive practice. So this was an example of a book that was a bit before its time, but, you know, investing in the right ideas has really paid off. And it's, it's very, it's getting a lot of attention right now. Um, yeah. And there are other examples such as neuroscience or advocacy, um, uh, racial and social justice, um, all of these areas, I can name publications that we took a risk on early on that were not necessarily pegged to a specific course, but the the courses came later. Um, and it was more about, you know, my belief in what the kind of core values are of a discipline and what the emerging trends are and and uh, taking a risk on that. And it's paid off time and time again within my career. That's fascinating. I've never really thought of the chicken and egg situation you're talking about. Like, well, we can't have a course without a textbook or, you know, the textbook is comes before the courses are. So it's a fascinating conversation between the publishers and the uh, faculty at, at schools. Mm -hmm. so that's, that's when it so, makes me feel very much like I'm contributing to the, the discipline. Um, of course, we're a commercial publisher and we need to publish textbooks for key courses, but the, it, it's often these emerging areas that really feel like we're moving things forward in some way. So I'm, I'm impressed by your ability to predict the future. Thank you. So um, I, I, one of our other guests, Suzanne Pritzker, is uh, needing to leave uh, fairly soon. So I wanted to uh, turn to her, though, uh, and ask her the, the question about what's your book about that you want to talk about and why did you write it? Right. And thank you, Suzanne. I know I should say some things about you because you have a very long uh, thing, but um, you're like the associate director and, and you run everything at the University of Houston and dealing with politics and political social work and you run this the legislative internship program so I'm, I'm sorry I forgot to tell all these wonderful things about you before turning but now it's your turn. Thank you. <laughs> so uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'm really excited to talk about, so I'm going to talk about this book. Um, so Shannon Lane, who is also on the panel, will speak with you shortly. Um, she and I worked on this book, Political Social Work, Using Power to Create Social Change. Um, I don't think I've ever had the opportunity to just talk about why this book. So um, when... So actually, you know, when it was interesting is when I was a student um, in social work, I came to social work knowing I wanted to do policy work, knowing I wanted to do political work. My background actually had been in policy before I came to social work. Um, but I didn't know this terminology, political social work. What I knew was advocacy, which we've talked about, policy change. But I... But I, you know, until I came to the University of Houston, I actually didn't really realize this whole history of political social work that had been happening um, and growing both out of University of Houston, University of Connecticut, and this focus on not, not only this changing policy from, from, from the outside trying to shape policy, but also the ways that we engage with our political systems, the ways that we run for office, the ways that we work on campaigns, the ways we change policy from the inside, from the outside, in, in really attuned to these power dynamics and, and then the, the political dynamics that are taking place and that we really want to be front and center on. And as I started to really kind of get into and really understand political social work more, I really started to both teach and do research um, on this. And so Shannon and I have done a number of research studies together around political social work before we got to this book. Um, and I was also teaching classes where my students were coming in really wanting to learn advocacy, but to, le to learn really the whole spectrum of how we can change policy and change politics and utilize politics to make change in, in, in this country. Um, so 
this kind of brought together a number of threads that I think led Shannon and I to come together. And I'm going to share my perspective and Shannon will share hers, um, but that led us to come together to this book. I think that as all this work had been going on around political social work, both in programmatically, um, whether that was the specialization, the concentration specialization at University of Houston, the campaign school that many of y'all have heard about at University of Connecticut, this sort of programmatic ways. And then there was sort of really more, you know, a, a smaller body of, of research that was happening, but we were seeing sort of this, this growing es es establishment of really politically oriented um, focus um, in social work. And really, I think wanted to, 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 to help institutionalize that in social work, to help really claim this and help folks have some terminology and ways to talk about and think about this work that, that Shannon and I were seeing many people wanting, wanting to do. Um, so I think that was one of the impetuses for us to come to together to work on this work. But also, I think as we were teaching, um, we I had the opportunity to kind of create, really recreate and think about what teaching cha political change and policy change look like in our curriculum. And, and it, Shannon was doing some of that herself. And we found ourselves texting each other at all hours of the night, like, hey, do you have any case studies on these ethical dilemmas that we experience in the politi in political arena? You know, hey, do you have any resources on this? And we were searching and searching for practical hands-on resources to teach in a really applied way in our classrooms. Um, and every time, we sort of ran into a wall. We were like, you know, we need to work on that one day. And we were kind of creating this sort of ongoing set of things that we were finding that we wanted and that our students were asking for to do. Um, and so as those came together, we started really just talking about that we want, I think what was interesting for us is that we weren't, we were looking, we wanted to create a book that could be utilized as a textbook, but could also be utilized by all the practitioners we were connecting with that were saying, I wanna get involved in politics and I don't know how. I have graduated from my MSW and what I didn't learn is how to, trans to, to impact the political systems. And I wanna learn and I need something and I don't know where to go. So we really were sort of straddling this, like we see a need for a textbook and we see a need for a practical handbook. And I think that's, a a struggle that we had throughout, but something that we were really thinking about. Um, so as we started just hearing this and seeing this and, and having students in our own programs and other programs really say we want this, um, we started to really put this together with the list of things that we had been collecting that we wanted to have resources on. Um, but also like, what were we hearing? So something that I was hearing a lot of is my students kept saying to me, I want to be a political social worker. I know this is what I want to do. I want to, you know, really change our, our structures, our systems, run for office one day. I want to do all this, but I don't, I don't, I don't know anybody who does this. Like, I'm hearing you, you're telling me this, but what does this look like? And so, you know, again, I'd reach out to like, who do you know? Who do you know? And we're trying to connect them with people. But students are like, I need to visualize this. Otherwise, this I'm being told elsewhere. And I think this is a reality in a lot of policy work. Some of you all on the call may have experienced this. They're saying, you know, students were saying to me, I see an image of what it looks like to be a school social worker. I see an image of what it looks like, you know, to be in medical social work, but I can't see this. And I want to see it because I can't, understand this career that I think that maybe I want to go into without that. So we were also really hearing and thinking that, about students wanting to see this in real life. So I think we brought all of these different threads together to create this book. We think of it as a really practical, we are, it's full of like, do step one, step two, step three. Like, if this is what you want to do, here is how you do it. It's full of like models of you want to write a policy analysis brief or you want to write a white paper, you want to write a press release, step, step, step. Um, and we really tried to kind of think about what are those pieces that people are coming to us looking for? How can we do this? And then we interspersed throughout models of different 
so political social workers that we had engaged with and having them tell their stories of what they do and what that looks like so that students could start to really see themselves and say, oh, I see Ana Rodriguez and oh my gosh, I love what she's doing. That's what I've been looking for. That's what that looks like. That's the kind of work we could do. So I think for us really piecing together all of these, these pieces, um, showing you know how you actually do this giving real life dilemmas that students could think through giving these sort of um pieces that like literally this is what a budget looks like this is how you go and research this information that we've been telling them it's telling students for years to go look at but like here is how was really what we were trying to do um in the in this book is kind of weave all those different threads together i think um cassie mentioned sort of curriculum something else we wanted to do is we didn't want to frame this like this was outside the curriculum so we really sat with the CSWE, the Council on Social Work Accreditation um, competencies that guide us in all of our education. And we really intentionally went in the book and we talked about, here's where this work is assessment. This is where this is intervention. This is where this is engagement. This is where this is evaluation. And talk about how each of these, you know, all of the things we're talking about map on to this other education, you know, to the, to the larger framework for education, because so often this has been seen as outside of, of social work education. And we're really trying to bring that, that in. So we have a whole chapter develop, devoted, for example, to evaluating political social work practice um, and really using these these examples to sort of map on to this is a way you can teach evaluation in your programs. Um, so I, I hope I'm <laughs> addressing some of the questions here, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about our book. Thank you, Suzanne. That was a, a, a great description of your book and the ideas behind it. Um, let, let's go ahead and turn it over to your co-author, Shannon, and see what she would like to add to that, uh, that history of your book and, and ideas. Sure. Well, so as usual, Suzanne is more prepared than I am. I did not bring the visual aid of the book, and I also didn't bring my. I don't have the the copy of my of my other book. Um, so um, that has been the history of our writing together, I believe. Um, so, and I want to echo what Suzanne said that part of the reason that we wrote this book is that we we knew that there was something missing. Uh, there wasn't anybody else who was who was presenting things in a way that we we wanted it, and our students were saying they needed. And I guess. You know, I don't know how many, you know, potential book authors are in the audience. Um, I, you know, one of the things I would say is I think it's so important um, to think about whether your voice um, is out there. And, you know, the, the, the panel that we have today are, um, you know, primarily women and all white. And I think there's a tremendous need in social work literature to have the voices of lots of different people. Um, and so I would encourage you, especially if you don't see your experience reflected in books, um, to think about, you know, putting yourself out there, which I will say is a really hard thing. Um, the first meeting I ever had with an editor to talk about a book was one of the scariest things that I'd ever done. And I, I'm sure, Cassie, you don't think of yourself as scary, but like, you know, I sat down with, with Jennifer, um, Jennifer Hadley from uh, Springer, who ended up being somebody I loved, and I was just scared to death to talk to her. Um, but it was really important to me once I got over that fear to be able to sort of talk about what what we saw as a need. Um, and Cassie also mentioned this idea of evolutionary versus revolutionary. And I think sort of for us, we thought of the book as revolutionary, but we really present we needed to figure out how to present it as evolutionary, both for the publisher to be on board, but also for other potential um, readers of the book and, you know, faculty who might put it into their classrooms. Um, and I think the the other book that I worked on uh, that I co-authored with Elizabeth Pally and Corey Steima is called Social Welfare Policy in a Changing World. And that one is out of Sage Publications. And that one is more of a traditional policy text. And so that was sort of an interesting experience for me because we took sort of like the typical policy textbook. And then I think there were places that we could do some really adventurous things because we were, it was clear what class it was intended for, like literally social welfare policies in the name of the book. So it was clear what kind of class you might want to use it for. And then so within that, you know, we could put lots of really practical advocacy tips and we could sort of push the envelope on some of the things we suggested. We actually have a vignette in that book on vaccinations that suddenly seems really relevant to everyone. But a couple of years ago when we wrote it was, was not something that a lot of people were talking about. Um, 
And so I would encourage people to think about that. I just think there's a lot of opportunity to to do the different thing you want to do, um, but sort of convince everybody that it's not that it's not so different. Um, the other thing, you know, I think, um, I, you know, when we were talking earlier, Rick had asked us to think about the difference between writing a journal article and writing a book. And I think uh, part of what really st stands out for me is that if, you know, if Bob Fisher hadn't written a journal article about political social work, and if Nancy Humphreys hadn't created the Political Institute, and if Suzanne and I didn't have a track record of writing peer-reviewed publications that were well-received, I don't think we would have had the chance to do this book, right? The When I look at this book, it's not a standalone thing that Suzanne and I got up one day and decided to do, right? It's the culmination of a lot of work that we had done over our careers, building on a lot of the work other people had done during their careers. And I think that's a really important um, aspect of the process. Like it, and, and we have continued to think about these things and write about these things. And, you know, hopefully most of you got to hear Suzanne talk about political justice earlier. Um, you know, if we have the opportunity to do a second edition, I definitely want political justice to be more front and center. Um, I also, and I, this wasn't necessarily on, on Rick's list, but I would say one of the hardest things for me about this is selling a book, right? Both like in saying to people, hey, you should buy this thing. You should spend a lot of money on this thing that I wrote. Um, but also because obviously publishers have to make money. But anytime we're asking students or practitioners to spend money, I think there's sort of a like an instinctive need to make sure that they're spending their money wisely um, and figuring out how to, you know, how to talk with the publisher about how much the book was going to cost was really hard. Um, Honestly, like Suzanne and I do very little of the selling of our book. Ali Lozano and Justin Hodge uh, have sort of a, a decided that they are the salespeople for our book and they talk about it everywhere. They do a much better job than we do about convincing people to buy it. Um, but I also think some of that is honestly like a little bit gendered, right? Like I, I, it's, I feel like often I've been socialized not to talk about the stuff that I do and not to tell other people that it's good. And there, I've had a real struggle with that in terms of selling a book. And so I guess, again, thinking about potential book authors in the audience, if it's a little nerve wracking for you to think about selling yourself to a publisher or selling your book to people, that's a, a normal thing to feel like. But I, if you feel like you have something to say and nobody else is saying it and the, 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 the way that you approach teaching your class or talking about your issue is going to change the way other people think about it. Um, it's worth it. It's worth the discomfort. It's worth the, the long night spent copy editing um, when our families were very, very frustrated with us because they hadn't seen us in a long time. Um, we wrote one section of the book with Suzanne, like on the road on a family vacation and, and me like taking my family to the hospital because a bat had gotten in our house while we were writing. So there were a lot, I know, <laughs> there were a lot of, it was, it was a lot of work to do. Um, I often refer to the political social work book as my third baby. It took roughly about as long as it takes to, to make a human baby. Um, and it was, uh, it was a lot of work, but it was totally, totally worth it. So Rick, I'll turn it back to you unless there's anything else you wanted me to add. Well, I, I tell you what, we will uh, go around to everybody. And then if there's questions, and I, I know, Suzanne, you may have to drop off, but um, I'm fascinated to hear the backstory you know, of, of your book. And uh, I'm reflecting as, as you both have spoken about my own journey as a, as a textbook author. So, uh, but before we get to that, I want to talk about Jessica Ritter. And uh, let's see, again, here we go, Jessica Ritter. She's gonna be on the next panel too, talking about some other things. But today, let me just, or right now, let me just say, she is professor at the Department of Social Work at Metropolitan State University of Denver. Her career as a social worker and academic has been dedicated to child welfare and children's rights, as well as political advocacy related to issues of social and economic justice. Dr. Ritter has been teaching social work at the college level for 13 years. She's a Fulbright scholar and is the author of two books, 101 Careers in Social Work, second edition, and social work policy practice, changing our community, nation, and the world. Dr. Ritter received her doctorate, Master of Social Work, and Bachelor of Social Work from the University of Texas at Austin, which um, is 
So we have authors from three different Texas schools here. Uh, Jessica, I want to say that that I've heard through the grapevine that you have uh, you're working on another book as well. So um, welcome. I feel like welcome to the show. You know, I've, 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 anyway, um, I'll turn it over to you and, and hear your thoughts. Thank you. Thank you so much. And hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Rick. That was a really lovely introduction. I think I want to start, um, and hopefully I won't embarrass Cassie too much, but I did want to mention that I work with Cognella on this book. Um, so this is the book I'll be talking about today, Social Work Policy Practice, Changing Our Community, Nation, and the World, and it's in its third edition, and I love the cover so much. Um, one of the things that um, when you're an author, you want your cover to look really pretty, <laughs> and sometimes you have some say in your cover and sometimes you don't, but I just love this, this latest cover. Um, but I want to, I just wanted to mention Cassie and Cognella, because I think if anyone here is thinking about doing this and writing a book, um, and we can talk about how it feels like a daunting thing to do, I don't think I would have ever imagined I'd be writing books someday if you would have asked me that, you know, when I was a bachelor student getting my degree in social work. But I've worked with um, two other publishing companies, and Cognella is so wonderful. Um, you know, when you realize you work with a publisher, that gets it, that gets your discipline and truly cares about their authors. It's been such a great partnership. And so I'm actually embarking on a third book with Cassie, um, an intro social work book. So I don't know why I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> um, those of you who write books, you know what I mean? Cause it's a lot of work, but um, I'm very excited about that. Um, but I'm gonna get back to this uh, policy book. And, and it is interesting that we're all from Texas. You know, I know we know Texas is such an interesting place politically. That's all I'm gonna say about that. And so I do think it has, it kind of can produce um, some really interesting activists, um, you know, to, because of the environment, right? And so when all those years that I lived in Austin and the Houston area, I think I was really influenced by, by being raised in Texas, so. Um, but let me go back to the question that Rick posed, which is why did I decide to write this book? And I think it was really, it stemmed from teaching, teaching policy classes. And so, you know, I'm sure the other authors will relate to this. I taught policy for a number of years using other books. And I think what I started doing and not realizing it is that I didn't have the perfect book, right? And so I was sort of started to put together a blueprint in my mind, you know, and again, I don't know that it was super conscious of like, oh, if I had a book, it would do this. And, and it would really align with the way I wanted to be teaching policy. And then I remember one day just sort of saying, well, I wonder if I could write this book. <laughs> and again, I think that sometimes we have to overcome our own, you know, sort of doubts and can I do that, you know? And um, so anyway, I mapped it out though. And that was the first experience I had of um, realizing, yeah, I think I have something here. I have an idea. I think I can bring something new and different to, to these kind of books that maybe I wasn't seeing. And then I'm gonna write it all out and I'm gonna come up with my concept and map out the chapters. But then I have to convince a publisher that this is a good thing. And so going through the experience of shopping it to a, a few different publishers, and then, you know, luckily the good news hopefully happens that at least one of them says, yes, we love your vision. We would like to work with you. And so luckily that happened with this book. And, um, and it's also really wonderful to improve a book over time. There's the experience of writing a first edition, right? And it's so much work and it's really hard. And then, you know, you get to write the second edition and you get to improve it. And now with the third edition, you know, I'm starting to feel like, wow, it's this book is really um, where I want it to be. Uh, but there's always improvements every time that you do it. Um, but let me just kind of say a few things about what I'm trying to accomplish with my policy book. You know, I, I always think about students, honestly, because when you teach policy, you know, you have a lot of students that are coming into your classes that where policy is not their first love and they're intimidated by it and they don't know a lot. And it doesn't do a good service when they have a book that's also not very exciting to them. So, you know, the kind of things we might typically hear from traditional policy books is it's kind of dry and it's kind of boring. And that's 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 not great when you're trying to get students excited. So I know that the big motivator for me, all the words, I'll just kind of say some words, you know, I want it to be readable. I want it to be accessible. And ultimately, I want students to read this book and be find it interesting and inspiring. Right. I want I want it to inspire their interest in policy work for some of them. And so the big idea I think that I realized I wanted to bring to this book were stories, because even though we have to cover some nuts and bolts material of policy, and you have to do that, 
Um, I, I thought, you know, what would be interesting for me as a student, and I think for many of my students, is um, telling these really engaging and inspiring stories where a group of people came together to try to create policy change. Um, so I'll give you some examples of that. Um, and then kind of showing what does coalition building look like, right? You can see it when you're telling a story. What does framing an argument look like? What does providing testimony look like and lobbying? and organizing protests and rallies and those kind of things. And you could kind of see what it looks like if you're telling a story. So a few of the stories I tell in the book, for example, is how did activists um, pass death with dignity laws, especially in the first two states where we had that in Oregon and Washington state. Um, the dreamers, um, these really inspiring undocumented youth, how did they, um, all the activism that they do in trying to pass the DREAM Act. Um, then I tell the really great, this is very grassroots, but the Mad as Hell doctors, um, and they were a group of doctors, physicians, and also nurses were involved, and they were trying to influence the healthcare debate before Obamacare was passed into law, and really trying to move the needle on universal healthcare. And then how did uh, mental health advocates pass the Mental Health Parity Act? Um, really, really fascinating story. And then finally, the last example I'll throw out is, you know, the legalization of same-sex marriage. And how did that really happen? I mean, we saw it sort of happen, but to really read about the advocates and how they were very strategic in terms of thinking through how we would change the needle on legalizing same-sex marriage. Um, so those are the things I was really motivated by. Um, and I luckily, it's really, I'm sure the other authors agree that the the most gratifying thing ever is when you get feedback, um, you know, when people read your book and students read your book and they tell you, wow, I liked it. And it really, um, I learned. <laughs> so anyway, I'll go ahead and stop there for now. Thank you, Jessica. Um, you know, I, 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 there's a, there's a, uh, a danger in coming after such dynamic other authors and uh, and and I want to thank you all for for your your stories about how yours came to be. Um, um, I'll I'll add my own stories and let me, let me throw out like we're all we're all practicing for our time on uh, on big TV shows and this is my first advocacy book. Uh, it's now in the fourth edition. It was originally published with uh, Lyceum Press, which has been bought by uh, Oxford University Press, and they, um, they continue it. And uh, we're working on the fifth edition now. So uh, it's the, the, the great thing about other, other people's books is like, I have to read them myself. And um, I, I think, you know, that's really a good part. And how would I, you know, bring that idea in? Um, but I think that th what brought me to write the book, first of all, was uh, like other people, I wasn't happy with what I was, uh, which, with what was available. Uh, I think we all owe a huge debt to Bruce Jansen, who originated the term policy practice and has had a wildly successful career in, in getting this to be part of the social work curriculum. Uh, obviously other people, uh, in the community uh, practice field and uh, administration have done great work as well. But I think uh, I tried to get Bruce to, to come on this panel. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he couldn't make it, but I, I hope to uh, have a chat with him in a similar way uh, in the near future. Uh, at, at the time that I wrote the first edition, there were a couple other uh, books on advocacy. Um, Karen, um, uh, I'm blanking on the last name, but uh, she was from Texas as well. And uh, she and uh, had a book that was like political social work. And it was a pioneering textbook. Uh, you know, people move on in their careers, though. And, and even though there's a new edition, that doesn't necessarily have very much new material. So I'd become, I'd use that book. I wanted uh, something else. There's another book by, um, by Bob that... Um, we, we talk about, um, and there was one by Mark Azell, but they, I wasn't satisfied with them, right? So everyone, when I was teaching a course on advocacy, I kept coming up with new ideas. And that's the great thing about teaching the course is that your students challenge you to get better and, and you do get better. You learn more, you, you do better. And so um, this emerged, this idea for advocacy practice for social justice book. 
And I remember being at CSWE talking to uh, the head of Lyceum Books, David Fulmer, and uh, like, I think it was good, just like it has been said that I had a number of journal articles out and, but a book is a different thing. I mean, it's a totally different writing experience in a way because uh, like you think you know what you're gonna write when you write the proposal. And then it's like, it doesn't, at least for me, it doesn't come out as easy as I think. It's a lot more work. But I think the core motivating idea behind my book, Advocacy Practice for Social Work Justice, is that my students kept saying, well, this is, this is just like other parts of social work. And it, it became very clear that advocacy is part of a generalist model. You start with assessment, you move on to engagement with the client population, and, and you work all the way through evaluation. And this is not something that I had seen reflected in the literature or any of the textbooks at the time. Um, and just like Bruce Jansen's ideas have become like almost, well, yeah, everyone knew that. There was a time when people didn't know that. Uh, and so I, I feel like moving on to the fifth edition, some of the ideas that I have are now like, oh, well, everyone always knew that. <laughs> but I, I, I'm proud to say, uh, as far as I know, I was the first person to, to, to model the advocacy practice sequence and, and parallel it with the uh, generalist practice model, a solve, a problem solving model. So that was really the impetus for me. And I, I just, um, there's a sense of pride when people write to me and say, yes, this is readable. I, I get what you're talking about. It's not too easy. It's not too hard. It kind of hits that sweet spot. So, um, you know, as, as the host of the session, I don't want to like monopolize it or, or go on too long, but I, I think just, um, I, there's a certain, for me, more pride in the writing a book, even though it's like a hundred times harder for me. A journal article, there's this set thing and you can almost say, okay, well, here's the lit review, here's this and this and this, and it's fairly well standardized. But a book, you actually put much more of your own voice into it. And uh, you can read the same information that uh, about how to write a press release. And my way of writing about it will be different than other people's. Uh, doesn't mean one of us is wrong or right, but um, I think we gravitate to different people's voices and to, to follow up on what Shannon said, if, if you don't see your voice or if you don't hear your voice in, in what you're reading as a student or a practitioner, uh, go look for somebody else's voice because um, it, it's probably out there. And if it's not, you know, write your own. Um, I, I tried to, to get some other uh, people on, on this panel, but um, unfortunately they weren't able. It would have presented a wider range of uh, visuals, uh, to, you know, and, and so um, it's important. And I, I feel also the great support from Cassie. Um, and, and, and the advocacy book has led to a lot of book chapters and other books. This is my Cognella, first Cognella book. And it has material in there on advocacy because management is advocacy in different ways. So I think all of us see the role of advocacy. It's much broader than uh, just the political system. Um, I, you have to uh, have advocacy within your organization. You need to know these skills. And so um, I'm just happy to be part of this group of authors and, and the editor of many of these books uh, and say, um, maybe it's time for us to talk to each other a little bit more and open it up for questions for each other. Or if there are questions from the audience that have filtered in, um, we, can, we can address those. So uh, Cassie, let, let me just ask you a, a question. Um, and how does it sound hearing these authors who have worked with different publishers? Um, I mean, ex does, is this mirror your experience working with authors, the, the way that we've talked about our experience with editors and things? 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, we don't see ourselves as scary <laughs> uh, for one thing, but I can see how it would feel that way. You know, it's it, writing is a very uh, vulnerable. I think you're putting yourself in a very vulnerable process. I see this over and over again, where working with very accomplished people and there's a little bit of a, you know, a shyness or a hesitation to share sometimes because particularly with us as editors, we're sort of the first people to see the writing. So there's always a little bit of, I think, you know, insecurity around putting my words out there and getting feedback from somebody. So our roles, not only in terms of how we can help shape the discipline, but it there's another aspect of it is being a cheerleader and being, you know, encouraging to our authors um, to help them feel supported and help them feel, you know, validated in terms of what they're doing. Um, you know, what Shannon was saying earlier about just feeling really reluctant to self-promote, I think is something I hear over and over again. And I try to exactly as you had said, Shannon, I think what I how I try to help the author sort of reframe and think about it is that it's actually a, a service to, you know, not only to the discipline, to other faculty, to students. Um, so, of course, there's some, you know, reluctance to self promote, but uh, I always see it as if you're having a challenge, if you've identified an area where you, you don't have a book or, or materials to use in your course, chances are that there's a lot of other people out there who feel the same way. So it's not about self-promoting yourself. It's about helping getting information and knowledge out there so that other people can use it and you know, do the same as you have done in writing the book. There's no point in writing a book if, if you're not going to get it out into the, the world so that it could be used and actually have an impact. So it's uncomfortable for a lot of people. And I think we, we try to work with our authors to at least get, you know, a, a, at least get some access to their network. So if they're uncomfortable promoting it, we would, we will happily do it. Um, but I think it's really, it's an, it's the whole reason why you write a book is really to get that information and knowledge out there. And sometimes it's a little uncomfortable, but I've seen authors grow, um, and become more comfortable with that aspect of it, especially as you get feedback from people. So, you know, you kind of stretch yourself a little bit, you, you get the word out there and then you start hearing positive praise and feedback, um, and then that becomes, you know, really uh, affirming that I, I do have a good idea. I do have information that's important to share and people are benefiting from it. Well, let, let me just uh, follow up with that, because, you know, one of the things that happens is um, it, it becomes a conversation with the readers. And uh, so one thing I just want to uh, ask the people who are watching uh, is, you're probably either a student, and so you have to read textbooks, or you're a faculty member who wants to, um, to adopt, you know, or have to adopt books. So if you would put your ideas and what you're looking for when you read a textbook or when you select a textbook, if you put those in the chat, I, I think that would be really uh, interesting and helpful to the authors on this panel. Um, well, Cassie, I think, I think it's just fascinating, you know, the interplay between editors and um, and authors. And I think that's been brought home to me in, in working with you. Uh, my first editor was, was David Falmer. And uh, I remember the first time that we were talking about the book after it had been published, he said something about, well, our book is doing great. And I'm thinking, what do you mean our book? I wrote it. <laughs> and I, I didn't give him the credit he really deserved for Lyceum Books and creating that whole thing. So um, just on behalf of of myself and all other authors who didn't understand the value and the importance of editors, I apologize <laughs> to the mass of, of editors. Um, now I kind of want to uh, turn it over to, the, to my panelists and say, what have you heard from your fellow authors that resonate with you? Or, um, you know, what, what else have you thought to say as, as we're waiting for perhaps uh, more questions from the audience? All right, Suzanne. 
Well, since I have to leave in a minute, um, one thing that I was just thinking about is actually kind of back to your question about peer reviewed articles versus books. And I think that's something, so the political justice talk that I gave earlier today, I would never have given that had I not written this book or had we not written this book that I think that writing a book, like when I read a journal article, there's a very kind of constrained set of things that I'm writing about. I'm writing about like, there's a specific research question. There's a specific or, you know, set of things that I'm writing about, but here we were really developing this book. And I remember like Shannon had a draft of the voter engagement chapter and like I was putting some context around it and I'm sitting and I'm thinking and all these things that were also happening in my real life, not my real life, but in my on the ground work in Houston were coming up and I was starting to think about this increasing sort of work I was doing in community around these barriers to civic engagement. And it all sort of came together and I had this opportunity in this place to start really reflecting on political justice and social work and to start to think about what that was. And we didn't go as in depth as I would, as, as we would today, you know, if we get an opportunity for another edition, but it was starting to just writing the book gave space to start to think about and process these ideas that then I know in my own work, I have come back to and come back to and come back to and come back to, but because I had that space that my day-to-day peer review, doing another research study, writing on another research study would never have given me that space to really sit and engage and to sit and engage. And I think really important here is having a co-author. So like I put this stuff down on paper and I, and I was like, I don't know, but this is what's going on in my head. And like Shannon to look at it and be like, you're onto something here. I love this. Let's do this and this and that back and forth. Like I honestly, I, I'm listening to y'all who wrote books on your own. I have no interest in doing that. What I loved was this like act of writing with Shannon, getting to like in the debates we had. So it wasn't just about this political justice, but we used to have these back and forth things about like whether it's worth it, whether we, what we want to write about, about going and like recruiting candidates it or running for office in districts where you can't win. And I'm coming from Texas and I'm like, you need to run people in districts. And Shannon's coming out of Connecticut. She's like, you don't waste your time on that. And we got into these really like, deep conversations and reflections as we thought about like the push just my thinking and and it our thinking in ways that we never had before that I see show up in everything that I've done since everything when I'm in the classroom everything when I'm writing everything when I'm conceptualizing another study are all so influenced by those back and forth conversations that we got to have in a really conceptual way in writing this book. So it's actually changed you. The whole process of writing the book has influenced and affected you in a way you probably never really imagined. And I see the book that you both wrote also as being one of these emerging areas and ideas that has now kind of caught up to where we are in society, where it's getting more and more attention. So congratulations to you both for having you know, the dedication to write it and, you know, the foresight to see the gap and the need and to follow through with it. And I've seen it happen over and over again, where the idea is before it's time. And it sounds like that with your book as well. Well, can I just add to that, Jessica? I don't mean, but we, we actually, we pitched the, we pitched this idea or some version of it to a couple other people and got told no. So I think that maybe is part of just the experience is that, and not every book is the right fit for every publisher. Mm -hmm. Um, And I also just wanted to say that about a year after that conversation, I called Suzanne and told her she was right, that you do need to run candidates in lots of different places. So I admit that. Sorry, Jessica. No, no, you're totally, you're totally fine. No, I was just going to jump in because I think um, when Suzanne raised this, um, issue of co-authors is an interesting one because I have one book where I have co-authors and then the policy book I did alone. So I've had both experiences and I think um, they're both great. Actually, I've had good experience both ways. I will say when you have co-authors and I know you know this, Suzanne, it just has to be the right co-authors because <laughs> um, sometimes when it's like not, a marriage, <laughs> it can be really terrible. So, um, so yes, when you have the right co-author or co-authors, it can be amazing. Um, yeah. And then I do think writing it alone, maybe it it is harder. I mean, you have more of the burden of the work for sure. And then maybe a little bit of a more, you know, writing in and of itself can be a hard isolating experience as we all know. And so you have to figure out how you're going to, who you're going to sort of bounce, bounce things off of in some ways. 
But the other thing I'll go back to is why book writing over journal writing. <clears throat> and I do think that we often feel constricted in journal writing, right? There's not a lot of creativity. And also the really depressing part is not a lot of people read <laughs> your journal articles, right? Um, so the thing that I really like, like about book read or book writing, I don't think I ever would have imagined I would have fallen in love with it the way I have, to be completely honest. And um, I just realized I, I truly love it. But creativity, having a strong voice and point of view that can really come through in a book is exciting to me. And the fact that people read it, um, you know, people will actually read, end up reading your work. So those are all the reasons why I, why I love book writing. And Jessica's book is one of our best sellers. So uh, it is definitely getting read, <laughs> exactly. having an impact. So. Well, I, I think uh, I, I agree with uh, what Jessica just said about the difference between uh, book writing and uh, journal article writing. But I have to say, uh, as a journal editor myself, um, some of the ways that I get to know people, uh, it, it, like the people that are on this panel, is because of your journal articles. And some of them I've published myself, and so I have that, that sense of responsibility as I'm putting together an issue is to... Yeah, which of the journal articles actually go a little bit beyond the formula? Which are the ones that are asking the right questions? And um, just like Cassie gets to read a lot of book proposals and she doesn't accept them all uh, because they're not a fit or, or whatever. Uh, I read a lot of journal articles and over time, um, it becomes easier to see the ones that have a fresh perspective or a new idea. Um, you know, or, or even just ask the same question and have a new set of data. And so I, I think there's a, a very nice interplay between like maybe getting your foot uh, in the door of writing through journal articles, which are, are a little more formulaic and, and helps you develop your ideas. And then being able to take that, those ideas and, and put it into a book form, which um, is also a conversation, like a journal article is a conversation between you and the people in the lit review, right? And some of whom have been uh, not on, on this earth for a very long time, or at least a while, and others who are the young, get the younger people challenging the ideas of what's, uh, what's the conventional wisdom. And both are really, really valuable. And I, I love to see my journal authors then go on and explore their ideas further. And once you have a body of work, and, 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 and this, this will sound perhaps not quite the way I wanted to, but uh, over the years, you develop a sort of wisdom as well. I mean, I think you can write journal articles and have no application to reality. Um, you know, like these people who have very large data sets and then just uh, like churn out articles. But uh, there's other people... Um, who have been around a while, and then they say, well, this is how this applies in the real world. This is how uh, practitioners may be able to use this information. So I, I'm, I'm, for, yeah, um, I'm emphasizing the idea that one can lead to the other. And then once you write the book, you have new ideas, and then you go back and you do more research and write more journal articles. So that is um, kind of my take on, on that question. Um, I think we may have had some questions come in. Right, okay, so that one, one of the issues that is new-ish in social work education is the anti-oppressive framework that's now becoming very important to, to everyone. Um, how, how do you see yourself when you write new editions or when you look at a new book? How, how do you pick which ideas to include that maybe weren't around in the in the first edition or when you first started. So um, Jessica Ritter, if uh, if I could ask you to, to start with that and then we'll turn it over to Shannon. Yeah, um, when I'm thinking about my policy book, which that's very fresh in my mind, because, you know, like I said, the third edition just came out very recently. Um, the nice thing about writing a policy book is um, you have to update it fairly frequently because, you know, there's some books that maybe like a research book, <laughs> things don't change that much, maybe. But um, policy, every few years, it can start feeling outdated, right? Um, so I think in some ways, the nature of writing a policy book sort of forces you to be very current. And so um, I think we all would probably say that 
what's been happening in our larger um, country and world and all the issues that have been percolating the last few years, um, we're going to be tending to that, right? Otherwise, you would never want to have a book out where people felt like you weren't current and not speaking to the important issues of the day. So, um, so, you know, in the latest policy book, I was actually, you know, it was really great to be able to talk about the emerging social movements, Black Lives Matter, um, but all the other um, movements that we've seen in recent years and updating that. Um, and then I was also thinking, you know, Cassie and I are kind of embarking on this new intro book. And we were thinking about what do we want to bring new to an intro social work book? Because, you know, intro social work books have been around and people do expect certain things from an introduction to social work book. Um, I have a special love for an intro social work class because that's the foundation. And when students take their first social work class, you really want to make sure that you have the class and the book that really brings all of that to life. And so, you know, Cassie and I both together agreed that we really want to infuse anti-oppressive content into that book. You know, I think what might be more traditional in an intro book is that maybe there's one chapter that gets devoted to it and it feels sort of sidelined in a way. And so we thought, you know, this is a really important moment um, and a change in social work education to really infuse it in a much more intentional and thoughtful way. So that's going to be one of the things that we are very careful to do in the new book. Well, and that's a, actually a great segue. So in the, so the, the, so not the book I wrote with Suzanne, but Social Welfare Policy in a Changing World, which is, like I said, a more traditional policy text, we had actually made the decision to try, rather than having a standalone chapter, to infuse issues around race and oppression and, and throughout the book. And we are getting ready to do the second edition. And I think we decided um, that we, we decided that it wasn't really an either or, that it needed to be both. So we want to continue to infuse um, issues around race and um, oppression and um, all, all those sort of other social issues that are just intertwined with the policy landscape throughout the book. Um, but also that we felt like students needed better language for it. Like they needed a standalone chapter on anti-oppressive policy practice before they got to the rest of that. Because in some places it feels to me like it's really obvious that we're talking, you know, when we talk about immigration or we talk about environmental issues, um, you know, we've got like a whole section in the environmental chapter around, um, you know, like like Standing Rock and the Dakota Pipeline. And, and I'm from South Dakota. So that was really important to me to include. I understand that we're doing that from an anti-oppressive uh, framework, but it may not be that obvious to the reader. And so that's one of the things we're going to try to tackle in the second edition is to is to create the separate chapter and hope that that's going to make the anti-oppressive work throughout the rest of the book more obvious. Um, and I and I think that, you know, for me, a really important part of that is just, you know, we, I think Cassie had mentioned getting feedback. Like, I love hearing from people who are using the book about what's working and what isn't working to figure out, is there is there a thing that I thought that was really clear that we can, we can amplify in the next? Um, but also just, I mean, it, sometimes it's stuff that you can improve, but, you know, we had a, we put in a chapter on environmental policy, which, uh, you know, is, not as common in social work textbooks as it should be. And so it's been nice to hear that people notice that and that they appreciate it and it's really helpful for them um, in the classroom as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we, we do a lot of surveys. So we'll do course surveys when we're kind of embarking on a, a big new publication so that we can talk to people who are teaching the course and, and get their feedback about you know, what they like or dislike about their current text, what the current trends are. Um, and those are really informative because they could help us develop features or a focus or chapters to include in a new book. Yeah, I'd, I'd say uh, to, to follow what Cassie just said is, is um, and this, this is, again, I learned so much from Cassie about the publication process and how important editors are. But when they survey people who are using the current edition of a book, you learn a lot about what's out there. Um, like I, I'm, I'm in a fairly large school. It's a state school. There's, there's certain parameters and, that I have to write within or work within. But the users of my book um, are in a lot of different contexts. And so uh, if, if we survey them, um, like Cassie does when, you know, and, and other 
publications do, publishers do. Uh, you really get a lot of ideas from other instructors who are using the book and saying, well, it's really good, except I have to supplement your chapter on, uh, on this topic and with these kind of materials. So maybe you could consider adding that material yourself. And uh, mm -hmm. so and the other issue uh, about policy book, and, and I have a co-authored book with John McNutt. Uh, it has a strikingly similar title to uh, another one. It's called Social Welfare Policy, Responding to a Changing World. Um, uh, there's only so many ways you can say social welfare policy, but um, but my co-author, you know, and I, we we get uh, comments from students, and just like all of us do, and those are really useful. Um, and things change between one edition and the next. And um, we were finishing this up just around the time of the Trump campaign, and I have a I also have a, a chapter in Michael Reich's new social. Uh, policy book, um, where I didn't know how to describe what the Republican Party was. Um, I mean, it's like, well, the, we have liberal and conservative, but those, those ideas didn't seem to fit anymore. Um, so <laughs> writing a book right after or right before an election is a very chancy thing. So uh, there probably we'll see a lot of new editions of policy books. <laughs> yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah, there's, there's a question that was submitted, which is how do we make textbooks more accessible? And not just in terms of uh, ADA requirements, but also pricing and things like that. And so uh, Cassie, maybe you'd start off with that. And then um, because that, that's kind of a publication and a publisher uh, question in a way, but also as authors, how do we ensure that, that our, our words are available to people in a way that, that they'll buy it and want to read it. So I, I think you, I didn't quite hear one key word in your uh, question. So it's more accessible in terms of pricing, is that? Well, is both that? Uh, pricing and also just like ADA things, like um, right. especially electronic books, they need to be machine readable and things like that. Yeah, so I think there has been a lot of, um, progress made in terms of having digital formats available. Um, I think what we run into is that the digital books are not as cheap as people might think they are. They still go through the same production process. We still have the same overhead. So they don't end up being a 995, you know, Kindle type version. So what we've found is that actually pricing our print books very affordably encourages students to purchase the print book. Um, the digital books are only, you know, they're available. They're not that much cheaper. They're probably 10 or $15 cheaper. And uh, students, we've done a lot of surveys and students do still prefer a print version of the book if it's not too much more expensive. What's really driven the, the digital sales is that the prices of books from some of the larger publishers had reached really outrageous levels, $200 a book. Um, we tend, our average book tends to be around $60, $70 for a four or 500 page book. So given the choice of that or buying a digital version for, you know, $50, $10 less, most students do opt for that print copy. And I think it's a better value for them. Um, because most of them who are going to go on into a master's program, if they're an undergraduate, uh, will want to hang on to those books. Um, if they go into clinical social work, they may want to keep it for their licensing exam or for their practicum or for internship. So we really do feel like we're providing very um, affordable books um, for students. They're very reasonable um, and it's much better for a student to have a print copy and hold on to it um, than to have a digital copy that expires. Um, so that's one thing I think that we've tried to do to make um, our content more accessible. Um, one big uh, initiative that we had over the last year was our company really decided to get behind the Black Lives Matters movement. And we um, recruited a top uh, psychologist who is a former editor of the Journal of Black Psychology, Kevin Coakley at UT Austin, actually, um, 
to develop a book, uh, Making Black Lives Matters, which is really addresses a lot of the systemic, political, uh, societal um, challenges that African Americans have had to deal with. And we're giving this book away for free. Anybody who is interested in using it in their classroom, the digital version is available for free. The print version is just the shipping cost. So that is our, you know, our commitment and our um, way of really standing behind what you know, our program, our publishing program represents, which is diversity, social justice, and it is top scholarship, a great book. Um, it's just about to publish. So there's a lot of excitement about press releases around this book and really, really just trying to get it into social work, into counseling, human services as an offering for students um, to really sort of learn what some of these critical issues are you know, not only in the criminal justice system, but in housing and policy, a lot of, it's a really great book. Um, so that's just one small thing that we're doing. Um, but I do think in general, the pricing is a, a huge barrier for a lot of students. And I do think the, the quality of the books that we offer, it tends to be higher, they're peer reviewed than just OER materials, which is becoming more and more um, popular, uh, but it's a it's a growing concern, I think, and the different di the different formats are important, which we do offer. So, Cassia, I think that the um, it's really important what your company is doing by giving away the digital copy and and really subsidizing the the print copy. Uh, all the rest of us have had a chance to plug our materials. Uh, if you have a chance, uh, could we get you to uh, put the information about your company's uh, website uh, in the chat and, and then maybe you'll get a rush of, of orders for the-, sure. for the yeah, book. definitely, I'll do that now. And then uh, Jessica and Shannon, uh, I think we're, we're coming kind of to the end of our talk, but, but there's a one last question that's come in so far, which is not only uh, accessible in terms of price and, uh, and such, uh, that I haven't even let you have a chance to talk about yet, but also representation. How do you ensure uh, the, the best possible representation of, of all the people who need representing in, in your textbooks? Um, Jessica, why don't you go and then we'll have Shannon. Yeah, that's such a great question. And what I love is that we're seeing students who are asking for this more and more than they ever have before, right? They're looking at the readings of our classes and they're looking at the books and they're looking at who the authors are and they do wanna see a lot more diversity. And so I really love when students speak up in their social work programs or even with their professors, which I know can be hard to do sometimes. Um, and I think for the most part, faculty and social work programs are trying to respond to that. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways you can do that as an author. I think it can be really helpful to obviously think about who your co-authors are. And, um, you know, even within a book, um, you can have, because I've already been thinking about with the intro book about asking people to contribute to different chapters of that book. So even if they can't commit to being like a co-author of the whole book with you, you could strategically have different chapters within your book where they get they get credit. So it's a really wonderful thing for them, but they get to put their name on a chapter or part of a chapter. So I think um, that's what I think about doing is how I can bring in um, more diversity in terms of who's contributing to the things that I write. Um, yeah, Shannon, did you have any any other thoughts? Um, well, yeah, I think um, I agree with everything that, that Jessica said. And I think, um, you know, there have definitely been times that I have have um, talked about doing a, a potential new product project and have decided that I'm not the right person to do that. You know, like, you know, I'm not the right person to write a Black Lives Matter book and I shouldn't be writing it. And so I think that part of that is, I think, for for people who who identify as part of a majority, whether that's white or male or, you know, heterosexual or whatever it is, to be thoughtful about where we're where we are taking opportunities and who might be missing out on an opportunity because we take them. Um, and I also would say that I think, I know that, um, so the, the editor I work with at Sage is Josh Perigo, who I know knows Cassie because he told me 
uh, he, he mentioned your name to me. Um, he is very thoughtful to make sure that when we send reviews out, we get a lot of diversity in the reviewers, both in terms of, of identity, but also like, are we getting for a policy book? Are we getting reviews from a lot of different parts of the country to make sure that we understand, you know, as the non-Texan on this group, like to make sure that we understand how the book plays in Texas as well as we do how it plays in the Northeast. And I think that's really important. Um, and I think there's a lot of opportunities, you know, I haven't done an edited book as of yet, but I, I know I know some people I know who have that getting ha offering a chapter in an edited book and making sure you have diversity in that can also be a really good opportunity for people who maybe don't have experience writing a book and maybe aren't sure they're ready to write a whole book to step up and write a chapter and uh, sort of have an intro into the process in that way. Um, so like I said, I can't speak to that personally, but that's certainly, I think, a good um, way forward. Um, but I also just think like talking about it, right? And acknowledging when, you know, there's people who aren't aren't at the table and aren't being listened to and figuring out how to make sure those voices come up, I think, um, you know, and I think we will continue to do it imperfectly as we move forward. And it's still going to be, you know, hopefully better to do it imperfectly than, than to shy away from it at all. Well, I, I know uh, there's, uh, we're running low on time. And if there's uh, any last words you want to say, I open the, the floor for that. Um, I'll just mention that Jessica is going to be with us at the next session, um, as well as Jerome Sheely, who uh, we haven't seen yet, but he's, it's going to be a great panel as well. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So uh, we are, uh, that will start at 145. So, um, but anyway, any last words? I'll just say if anyone has any book ideas, um, I would love to hear from you. Uh, it's kgraves at cognella.com. Uh, we're building and growing our social work program. Um, always looking for new and innovative ideas. So I uh, would love to hear from you. So. Excellent. Jessica or Shannon? Shannon, you I I would just say that if, um, you know, if anybody wants to, is interested in talking about what it's like from the writer's standpoint and wants to talk about what it's like to write a book, um, then please don't hesitate to, to reach out. I'll put my email in the chat as well. Yeah, and I would just encourage anyone here like me, <clears throat> like I said, I never would have imagined I'd be able to do this thing that I'm doing. Um, and I, I, looking back, I think um, what was really helpful for me before I would even be able to imagine writing my own book was uh, the first book I wrote was with a couple of co-authors and I really was able to get my feet wet and sort of learn the process and be mentored. Um, so I think also just knowing how to go to mentors and then at some point, you know, you really will find the confidence to, to sort of um, to do your, your own thing if you so choose. So that would be my advice. And thank you. I'm, I'm also willing to, to mentor. I think um, we all are. Uh, one of the great things about conferences where you actually get to meet people that you maybe didn't meet before is that chance to just run into each other. Uh, Jessica and I met uh, two years ago at CSWE and uh, we, we had some interaction before, but we had a chance actually to, at the Cognella booth to, to, to chat with each other for a while. And, and Shannon, I, I think... Uh, you, I was walking by and you called out my name and they, we had a great conversation there. So I'm looking forward to uh, conversations like that. And, and Cassie and I met uh, at, uh, at the booth, uh, Cognell booth a couple of years ago and uh, turned into new books. And so I'm, I'm so happy that all of you could be here on this panel. Like I say, I don't think I've ever heard of, of a panel at CSWE or any other conference where you talk about the value of textbooks in moving a, a field forward. And it's always these, uh, anyway. So thank you for, for taking a chance and being on this panel. I think it's gone really well. And uh, Suzanne, if you're listening <laughs> via the recording, thank you as well. And I look forward to the next session and uh, we'll see you there.